Hopefully this works. Uh, yeah, that was to be expected. Alrighty. I'm going to put this on because it is a little bit chilly in here. Actually able to turn on the air conditioning in my place. I love it. Because, yeah. Anyway, we're going to be going back to doing live streams. So we last did Louisiana. So we go to Maine, which is going to have two districts. Um, we're going to switch to 2010. I saw someone. We're going to switch to 2018. We're going to use pause it because it doesn't matter because we're not going to be using partisan data or anything else to draw. We're just going to be straight drawing the map because Maine has an independent commission. I'm going to wait till at least there's one person somewhere. So that way I can actually go for it. And here we go. Turn this on. Let's have some fun. I would hope there's somebody in chat. Oh, hey, Robert Washington. How you doing? Because one could reasonably debate um whether or not i should probably turn on the background map along the district lines there we go okay we're gonna put all of portland into this district also this really irritates me uh non-contiguous precincts or precincts like this where it's like half water half land and all that crap that really irritates me. But we're going to put all of Portland into uh, one precinct, or one district. There you go. And... Don't want to go too excessively far. I guess Rock Island, Owl's Head, Warren, Wallsboro is reasonable. And then do we want to go up to Lebanon? Yeah, I think we actually do. And then Augusta, Winthrop. Yeah, I think those actually would fit into the second or into the first. <sighs> because land doesn't always determine and control of the land doesn't always determine whether or not uh, you win a war 303 that's pretty good that means we're going to be slightly short but we can do this by county for the rest of it And if we turn off the precinct line, switch to precinct, turn on the labels, let's take a look at the partisan lean. And honestly, that's kind of what I expected. Slightly changing it. Um, let's go ahead and look at governor. Okay. Senator. Whoa, okay. Uh, that's because Angus King uh, won the Senate election there. Uh, President 2016. Uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, that was expected. Oh, for fuck's sake. For oh, God's sakes, YouTube. Really? Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of to be expected. Okay. I think the composite is actually reasonably fair. So, 
yeah, I think I think that's actually a very good, very well drawn map. Also, Maine's borders are really really unique because the technically, um, the way it's written is that Maine's borders will be the uh, with uh, Canada are the demarcation the lines that go of the highlands that travel that separate the waters that flow into the Atlantic from the waters that flow into the St. Lawrence River. Um, so you could probably actually um, argue that a good part of New Brunswick actually is rightfully Maine. But, 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 uh, the U.S. and Great Britain compromised because the U.S. argued it was basically like way, way out here. And the British argued that it was basically like right here. Yeah. Uh, no, that's, that's not how it works. Whatever. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next state after Maine. It's Maryland. There we go. I'm going to be using the 2010 precincts because screw that. Use a 2018 population. We'll use the composite because the composite is reasonably fair. And I'm pulling this up because I want to make sure I've got uh, Maryland's districts down correctly. Because it is quite possibly the ugliest map you will ever look at. And I do think Maryland's uh, government will be reasonably sure to attempt to keep it the same. Uh, we're going to put in the partisan lean. Put on district lines, turn up the opaque. That. And here's the thing. I... I disagree when people say that uh, Maryland's uh, Democratic Party is going to vote or going to draw a map which draws out the first congressional district. I don't really think that's the case. Yes, Maryland tends to have a slightly different uh, view on... <coughs> A very slightly different view on what counts as contiguous but I also don't think that they are going to if you want to see a state that abuses uh, water precincts it's Maryland I don't think they're going to push so far as to get rid of uh, the first district because they're not that far short. Yes, you can reasonably draw them out by including parts of Baltimore. But the problem is Maryland's Democratic Party, I think, is going to feel reasonably obligated to keep its VRA districts. The other problem is, actually, the Eastern Shore is kind of actually grown. So, yeah, Maryland is definitely a horrifically gerrymandered state. But something tells me that they're not going to uh, too far abuse the system. The 2nd Congressional District 
Yeah, the second district is the ugly one. The map colors, we're gonna do it like this. Oops, sorry, nope. What I meant to do is get rid of that, turn on the background map. Okay, so I'm trying to figure this one out. Because the second district, um, ugh, I have no earthly idea how I am going to actually do this. Um, actually, if you went for a perfectly contained, uh, like a an ungerrymandered map, you'd wind up with two or three uh, GOP districts. Maybe slightly, other than the first, slightly less con. Uh, competitive or slightly more competitive all right so i guess we'll include no we're not going to include the inner harbor we're going to but we're going to absolutely try to do what maryland does in real life and abuse those water precincts put the inner harbor in the second and absolutely, like I said, we're, yeah, yeah, I am very much aware of that, but we're not going to be playing that game in this series because uh, you can absolutely do it. It's just a very difficult thing to do, and I'm not interested in looking up where uh, incumbents of both parties live because I'm not really interested in that. Let's also try to make this a reasonably ugly district. Let's just have some fun with making this the ugliest, gnarliest district. Because that's going to allow us to make some really, really bad districts later on. Oh, for God's sake. Seriously? You want to do that? Okay, fine. It's literally making me try to redraw this crap. Uh, that was annoying. Losing, basically. Yeah. Okay. And, oh yeah, boys, we're going to be making this one of the ugliest districts we can get away with. And do I feel kind of bad about it? Yeah, kind of. But Maryland is going to basically do this crap in real life. So I'm not sure actually how bad I feel about it. Whoops. Yeah, that's not unreasonable. Okay, the third district. I believe this is actually Congressman John Lewis's district. Okay, so we're going to include this area. Let me switch it to the map colors. I want to change the brush size a little bit just to. There we go. Don't want that one. Uh, we're going to go over here. Though, then again, Maryland could absolutely get horrifically ugly. So maybe they will try to do something absolutely stupid with this. Okay, we're going to include Annapolis in this one. 
And by the way, before you say anything, yes, I know this is quite ugly. But, again, this is also Maryland. This is not unreasonable. As a matter of fact, Annapolis is actually part of it. And apparently it also extends into the D.C. Burbs. So we're going to do that too. Do I... This is... This is ugly. Interesting. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Yeah, exactly. Water precincts are rife for room two. Can I include Bethesda? Where's Bethesda? Uh, I can get... No, I really can't. Okay, so... Let's just make the third extra third and take it down this direction. Oh, whoops. Guess I can't do that. I'm already over. Damn. Nope. New. There we go. That's the uh, one. Uh oh. Damn, never mind. Okay. So I guess I have to go here, I guess. No. Trying to find the right precinct to add that was the one. <sighs> the HRE, but in America, yeah. No, the HRE was, at least everything was competitive. Okay, so I'm going to have to do the fifth first, because the fifth is actually down here. It doesn't include all of either of those. Cool. So, the... It looks to go this way. And then up into here. Okay. We can do that. And this is a situation where I'm probably going to be, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. But it isn't me that has sinned. It is the Maryland Democratic Party. Of course, YouTube is being a little bitch. Alrighty. Now time for the fourth. I'm not a fan of filibuster reform, if I'm 100% honest. I think the filibuster is necessary in the Senate. Because if you get rid of the filibuster, 
then what's the difference between the Senate and the House of Representatives? In, in all seriousness. I think you need something to separate the two chambers of com Congress. Otherwise, there's no point in not having a unicameral legislature. And if you have a unicameral legislature, like some are arguing uh, to, say, abolish the Senate, then your legislature is going to be too easily swayed by the ever-changing desires and whims of the public. And the truth is, public opinion sways way too easily and way too quickly for that to be a good form of government. That's why you need a tempering body such as the Senate. Which is determined based, which is uh, a longer standing body. So you'll have, you know, people who are more experienced in statecraft, but also people who are more experienced in uh, government as well. But they also stay longer, and that means that they can continue a more long-standing uh, plan of government. Okay, where's the fifth? Oh, that was the fifth. We're on to the sixth now. Okay, the sixth is up here. Does it include? No, okay. This one is designed to swing down and incorporate the DC burbs in order to create another democratic district. Okay. That means we're gonna put all of Bethesda in there. Um so yeah, I'm not a big fan of drastic reforms to the Senate. Um I think you have to have a body where senators can basically put their foot down and say, no, we're not passing this. We're not the House of Representatives. We can have a reasonable discussion on these policies, but for the love of all that is holy, let's actually take some time to think them out. Now, I do think the filibuster should actually require you to be speaking um, for, the, for the duration. I, I'm not above that sort of reform. And I'm also not above the idea that the filibuster should require you to actually be discussing the... Um, the topic at hand. Basically, don't just read from the DC uh, phone book. Also, let's have some fun here with the seventh, just to make this map extra, extra ugly. Perfect. Oh yeah, this is gonna make this map beautiful. And by beautiful, I actually mean horrendously ugly. Oh, perfect, okay. So let's turn on the partisan lean and exactly what I expected it to be. All right. Uh, let's do that. Turn on the labels and yeah, that is pretty much exactly what I expected it to be. That was kind of the goal. Well, that's kind of the point. Uh, I know... I know people will say, well, you live in a democracy, you live in a, dem a republic, right? And you should abide by what the majority says. But the problem is the majority changes its opinion far too often for that to be a reliable system of government. 
And without a check, you wind up with a system that will allow your, your government, your nation, to spiral off the rails. Tell me the world wouldn't be a better place if the German government in the 1930s had a filibuster. Tell me the world wouldn't be a good place. And can you really tell me with a straight face that the Georgia electorate actually wanted both Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff? Because I can tell you with a straight face they didn't. Because in the November elections for both of those seats, the general elections for both of those seats, in the special election, the Democrats failed to hit 50%, whereas the Republicans actually hit 50% if you combine all the Republicans and all the Democrats. The Republicans hit 50%. In the general election for the regularly held Senate seat there, Purdue won that election if you follow first past the post, but Georgia has a runoff system. Now, I'm not arguing the pros or the cons of the runoff system. I, I actually tend to favor the runoff system. But if you can tell me with a straight face that the majority of Georgia voters wanted two Democrats in the Senate, I'm going to call you a liar because the majority of Georgia voters didn't want it. I have no problems with the filibuster. I think there should be some reforms, but I have no problems with it as a principle. I think it's been misused at times, but I think it requires that changes in the Senate actually be popular changes and require some level of bipartisanship. And you cannot tell me that bipartisanship is a bad thing. You know, I may have my own personal beliefs, which tend to be radically libertarian, but in terms of government, I recognize that when both sides can agree on something, it's kind of a good thing. Because that means most of the public is going to be in favor of that policy. Yeah, no, I don't actually think they're going to do 8 to 1, mostly because they have to vaguely keep districts where they are, and two, they also are probably going to try and keep all their VRA districts, and Republicans would sue for partisan gerrymandering, and honestly, I'm not sure what the court is going to say about that. And as it is, the map is already extremely favorable for the Democrats. Um... Let's look at President 2016. Hit apply. Thank you. Okay, that's kind of what I expected. Center 2016. Yeah. Plus, I think it's a little bit more politically advantageous for the Democrats to do it like this. Now, this is a gubernatorial map, so that's kind of to be expected. Uh, you flip it to the AG, and that's a much more reasonable map. And, yeah. Senator, yep, that's what I expected. And President 2008, yeah, that's what I expected. Flip it to the composite. But yeah, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't like the uh, idea that you can just read from the DC handbook or read Green Eggs and Ham to do a filibuster. I don't like that part. Uh, I think voting rights and stuff like that, I think H.R. 1 could be construed as the federal government overstepping its bounds. Um, it should be an issue left up to the states so long as certain basic voting rights aren't, uh, aren't abused. Uh, and what I mean by that is no discrimination based off of age, race, or, or gender, um, because I am a little bit skeptical of their veracity to history, um, 
I tend to be is somebody who studied history. Uh, some I place high emphasis on historical accuracy in the games. Uh, that's why I don't do uh, custom campaign trails. I'm actually hilariously running a sort of alternate history campaign trail, and we've already diverged from our time. We diverged from the timeline in the very first election. We had an abolitionist somehow win because um, the person who was also running would have easily won in a landslide to be vice president uh, for George Washington, but the abolitionist happened to be not from uh, <laughs> the same state as George Washington. The other candidate was. So you can't vote for two candidates in the same uh, from the same state. So that accelerated the uh, that the timeline quite a bit, and things just got weird from there. Um, Uh, you know, we were talking about this the other day on God of Politics Discord, and I think the best way to deal with college students voting, I couldn't properly word this on your Discord at God, at God of Politics. The best way to deal with college student voting is have them vote where their residence is. And by their residence, where their officially declared residence is, the thing that shows up on your driver's license. Um, to me, that is, in my opinion, the, best, the proper way to handle college students voting. If their residence is their college town, and they can change their residence, it's not that hard. It takes about five minutes. You change your residence to that college town, or you are a resident of that college town, you can vote in that college town. If not, then vote where your residence is. It's not that difficult. And college students are a generally accepted excuse for absentee voting. It's just like military uh, members can vote in the state and localities that are their official residence. Uh, for example, when my parents were both serving... Uh, and actually, military spouses count in the same residence that um, uh, their spouse, who is active duty, is serving in. Uh, they can vote in wherever their residence is. My both of my parents, when you know, when they were both, when one of them was serving, they were Texas residents, and yeah. It was a it was an interesting one, but I think that's a not unreasonable way to handle that situation. I don't see for people who may be saying, "Okay, well, is what George is doing, uh, you know, voter suppression." Ending no absentee voting, no excuse absentee voting is not voter suppression. It's basically just saying you can't request an absentee ballot because you're too fucking lazy to go to the polls. It's all you're saying is, listen, if you want to be an absentee voter, be in the military, be in a college town that you don't, that your residence isn't in, or have some legitimate reason to not be there on election day. And it's not that hard to have a legitimate excuse. And with the availability of early voting... Oh, fuck off, YouTube. Okay, there you go. And with the expansion of early voting that we've seen in the past couple of decades... If you can't make it on election day and you need no excuse absentee voting, I'm sorry, but you're just not all that interested in voting. This uh, this past year has been a slight exception, and I don't even think that an unreasonable person would say, no, being afraid of voting because of a pandemic is an unreasonable, is not an excuse. No. 
being afraid of getting sick from a pandemic is is a perfectly reasonable excuse. If I were a Secretary of State or reviewing petitions for absentee ballots and, I, and somebody said, I'm afraid I'll get sick from a global pandemic, I'd say, eh, good enough for me. You can vote absentee. But in a year without a, you know, a global pandemic, I don't really see the reason why you should why you should just vote absentee because you don't want to go to the polls. But, you know, people are going to say, oh my goodness, you're some sort of whack job conservative. And by the way, I do actually think that uh, there should be a general citizen age. Uh, basically an age where you can drink, smoke, chew tobacco, uh, buy a gun, vote, serve in the military. And I think all ages should be the exact same. Age of consent. No. Um, going lib right there. Uh, <laughs> all right. We should be on to, what is it, Massachusetts? Yes, Massachusetts. Which has complete Democratic control, but at the end of the day... Uh, Yeah, it's this is a very easy one, and I really don't. Uh, we're gonna laugh when we get to the governor's one, but the truth is that this is going to be a very, very easy um, map to draw. Because guess what? What Massachusetts is gonna do? is they're just going to draw the lines, make them roughly equal in population, and that's going to be it. Because at the end of the day, um, the amount of people, or because of how heavily democratic Massachusetts is, you're not going to get a Republican district, no matter how hard you favor it for the, how hard you gerrymander in favor of the Republicans. Because uh, guess what? That's just kind of the truth of the matter. Massachusetts is that heavy of a Repub of a Democratic state. Went too far, and God damn it, YouTube, your piece of shit. There we go. Uh, yeah. You need to be 30 in order to run for, um, really, Howie Hawkins. He's not even a break 1%. And sorry to my... Uh, friends who lean uh, towards the Greens, uh, the Libertarians are going to beat the Greens unless the Greens nominate a celebrity. And Libertarians are far more likely to do that. Um, the only way the Greens are going to be relevant in national politics right now is if they nominate uh, Jesse Ventura. Because at least Jesse Ventura can make the argument to um, the American public that he is qualified to run for president because he was a governor. And he was the governor of Minnesota. And back then, he was a member of the Reform Party. Which the Reform Party, for those who don't know, we're going to wind up talking about in my American History series, but eventually, someday, right? Um, the Reform Party was kind of the brainchild of Ross Perot, 
who is a very interesting figure. Um, and kind of brought protectionism back into uh, the American vogue, uh, so to speak. Now, the issue with that is that the... The issue with protectionism is that at the end of the day, if you want to see how effective protectionism is, uh, look at the Smoot-Hawley tariff, uh, tariff Act. You want a lesson in making financial problems worse? Uh, that's where you go. No serious economist thinks that tariffs are a good idea. And actually, I was basically a statistics class and a basically Excel certification away from getting a degree in uh, economics. To go along with my history degree. But no, in all seriousness, uh, tariffs are an incredibly dumb idea. And I, I don't see a reasonable justification for them. You can say it's about protecting American industry, and I'm going to say, yeah, because that worked so well uh, right before the Great Depression. If I accidentally drew a GOP district... Because I'm trying to satisfy so okay. Need that. Uh, that nope. How about this one? Nope. Nope. Damn it. How hard is it to find Precinct that'll put me in the right spot. Come the fuck on, seriously? I need to do that anyway, so. Come on. Uh, I think, I think it that's a bit too early, in my opinion, for the Democrats to win Texas. I mean, I could very easily be wrong, but uh, oh yeah, county lines here are absolutely worth. God, city lines are even worse. Um, okay, we're just gonna draw.
this is not going to be the ugliest district I've ever drawn. I've drawn some ugly ones, including in this series. Also, the other reason why I didn't draw a 8-0 uh, Maryland is because I think the Democrats are actually maybe going to try to play by the rules and redistricting. Hey, yo, shots fired. Okay. Uh, let's avoid Boston, because I think Boston might technically represent a uh, VR, VRA district. Not entirely sure about that, to be one, to be entirely honest with you. Nope. Yeah, T. Yes, then we get the little T. Curva. Whatever, we'll leave it there. All right. Cape Cod and Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. I love that non-contiguous district, right? Or that non those non-contiguous precincts. I I fucking love them. Like, seriously. <laughs> um... <sighs> Who do I think is going to be the Republican nominee in 2024? I don't actually think Trump is going to run. There's going there's going to be a lot of people saying, oh, come on, how can you say that? He's obviously going to run, and he's obviously going to win. But is he? And I, I genuinely don't think so. I think it's all going to come down to... The fact that I think, genuinely speaking, the Republican Party is. They've got to evolve. They can't be the party of. They can't be the party of Trump. You know, there's going to always be some level of Trumpism within the GOP. That's that's not up for debate. I'm not even going to attempt to argue that it is. Trumpism is going to be here to stay. That I can I'm going to promise you is absolutely the case. What I'm instead going to argue is that it's not, I think the Republican Party is done with Trump the person. You know. I think the longer we take a look at what happened on the 6th, I think it's going to be too easy for people to argue that moderates don't want somebody who could be reasonably argued to be complicit in an attack on the government. <laughs> you know? And I don't actually see... Uh, Donald Trump being able to make a comeback. The middle and the swing voter, they, they're they not going to vote for Trump himself. They may vote for somebody who speaks on some of the same terms, but they want somebody who has some level of understanding for, I guess, propriety.
some level of reasonability. So if I had to take a guess as to who the Republican standard bearer is going to be in 2024, while I think the Republican Party would be much benefited by, say, a Tim Scott or a Nikki Haley, or I, I'm a devotee of the Paul family, so Rand Paul's, Ron Paul's, but uh, it would be Ron, uh, Rand Paul in 2024. I also recognize that at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be someone who is able to capture the imagination of the early state GOPers, and Ron DeSantis kind of is able to make that argument. Oh, perfect. Three voters. Perfect. All right, so we can do it like this and like Thank you, OBS, for actually reconnecting. And YouTube, you better behave. Seriously, YouTube, actually behave. Okay. Let's turn on that partisan lean, and yeah, that's actually kind of what I expected. Uh, in reality, these districts are all much more Democratic-leaning than... Uh, than the composite shows. Yeah. This was 2016, right? Yeah. 2018 Senate, eh, slightly less blue than I thought. Governor 2018, that is what I expected. AG 2018, that is more along the lines of what I expected. Senator 2014, it's kind of what I expected. Governor in 2014, yeah, that was uh, an actually competitive race. And then President 2008, yeah, that's what I expect. And the reason why this is, is because Massachusetts likes its liberal Republican governors. We're going to move on, and uh, how long have I been streaming even? Uh, about an hour. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do one more state. We're going to do Michigan, and we're just going to do it with those. No. No. I said no. Okay, there you go, OBS. Thank you. Uh, no, I have not played that uh, Hoi 4 mod.